Let's start with the Packers, though, guys, and Jordan Love's new deal. Love's big four-year extension equates to an average of $55 million per year, which matches Trevor Lawrence and Joe Burrow for the highest average per year among current quarterback contracts. And after Tua Tungavailoa got his bag on Friday as well, the 2020 draft class makes up for three of the four highest average per years among current quarterback deals. Love spoke Saturday about the elevated pressure that comes with that new deal. Being a first-round pick, there's pressure. Um, becoming the starter, there's pressure. But there's, there's always pressure. And I think that's, you know, part of the job that, you know, we sign up for. you got to find ways to deal with that pressure and, and handle as best you can to, to be the best player you can be every day. But there's always pressure. Um, there's no hiding that. You know, I've, I've been in some pretty pressure situations, so I think there's always going to be that. But um, just find a way to navigate through this and handle it as best I can. You know, it's important to note that Jordan Love may be relatively inexperienced, but he's not young, and you hear a lot of his maturity in the way that he answers things. Adam, we felt like this deal was going to get done, but how were the Packers and Love finally able to agree to it? Listen, they had a padded practice on Saturday, their first padded practice of the summer, Laura. It was no coincidence that one day before, both Tua Tungabailoa and Jordan Love get their deals done, and the Packers do it right before their first padded practice so that Jordan Love could be out there. Look, this was something that both sides wanted and were working towards. They had talked about the fact that they wanted to have this deal done in place by the time training camp opened. Well, it wasn't in place by the time training camp opened, but it was in place by the time the first padded practice of the summer took place. That was an artificial deadline that both sides were able to meet, and it wasn't really hard, especially once Tua got his deal done. You know what the average on this deal is going to be. It's going to be about $55 million, which is where the deal came in, and it's a four-year deal, which means that Jordan Love is scheduled to become a free agent again after the 2028 season when he'll be 30 years old, and who knows what the quarterback contract numbers will be like at that point in time. But this was something that both sides were working towards all during the offseason. They knew it would be coming, and they were able to put it to bed on Friday evening. So, Mina, he didn't shy away from that pressure, right? What does need to carry over from the end of last year for Love to live up to now these heightened expectations? It's interesting to hear you talk about pressure, to hear him say that word several times, because that's actually what I think he needs to continue playing well under. Literally, I'm speaking, not of the metaphorical pressure, <laughs> but how he good he was um, when he had pass rushers in his face. And that was probably the biggest distinction, Laura, between the first and second halves of the season. The second half of the season, Jordan Love was elite in a number of categories. He was one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. But what really stood out to me watching him was his play under pressure. First in QBR of any quarterback in the second half of last season. QBR of over 80, and there was a litany of reasons for that. Some of it was uh, his faith in the structure of the offense, his understanding of it, knowing where his outlets were, but also his physical tools. He's just so good at making those off-platform throws, moving inside the pocket. Versus the first half of the season, uh, under pressure, he had a QBR of 13, which was bottom 10 in the NFL. I think it's more likely than not that we will see second half Jordan Love next year for all of the reasons I described, but also for the additional reason uh, of the fact that he gets to play with this incredibly young group of pass catchers that he now has a year of experience playing with. They will be better and he will be better with them as a result. They went through some of those early season challenges together, which is important. There he is, Ryan Clark. Welcome to the show. We're so glad to have you here with us. Let's get your take on Jordan Love, RC, after he gets this big deal on Friday. What are your thoughts? Uh, the first thing was I forgot I was on Central Time, so I was going to start this zones, show at man. 4 o'clock Central. They'll get you. Which would have put me an hour <laughs> late. Uh, so that would have been bad. <laughs> You know, I think the, the thing about Jordan Love is I don't believe that the pressure has actually heightened in any negative way. The only reason that there are higher expectations of Jordan Love isn't because of the money. I believe all of these good quarterbacks are going to get 
good and very plentiful contracts. It's because of the way he played down the stretch of last season. It's because this team was 30 minutes away from being in the NFC Championship because they were beating the San Francisco 49ers on their home turf. And much of that is because of the play of Jordan Love. Now you add Josh Jacobs. Mina already mentioned how good this young core of wide receivers are. And part of their maturation process went along with the ascension of Jordan Love as well. So I'm excited to see what Matt LaFleur and Jordan Love do this year and now understanding each other a little bit better than they did before last season and also having confidence in the fact that their relationship can work. Well, you heard Mina talk about the fact that Jordan Love handled pressure last season, the pressure that came at him. And really, it's been that way throughout the course of his entire career in Green Bay. There was the pressure of coming along with this team trading up in the first round to go pick him at a time when Aaron Rodgers was on the roster. There was the pressure that came along with trading away Aaron Rodgers, knowing that it was your job and you had to replace the latest Green Bay quarterback legend. There was the pressure of having to play with this team not picking up his fifth-year option, knowing that you were playing for the type of contract that he got on Friday night. There was the type of pressure that came at him last year. There was the type of pressure that came along in the playoffs where they went into Dallas and beat the Cowboys sailing. There has been pressure all throughout his career. He's met every obstacle so far and proven himself, which is why he landed the contract that he did. Pressure has been nothing to Jordan Love, and it will continue to be something that he will continue to try to combat this upcoming season and for the remaining years in that contract. Yeah, this wasn't real pressure like in game, but even when he got out there for that first padded practice on Saturday after, of course, all this talk around his deal and then he ends up signing the deal, he threw a nice touchdown, touchdown pass pretty early on in that one and looked exactly like he's always looked, um, at least in recent memory. Tua <laughs> Tungavailoa finally got his big payday, but considering he went one and six, including playoffs against teams that finished the season with a winning record and eight touchdowns and seven picks in those seven contests. Some people raised their eyebrows, but comparatively, Tua went 10 and one against teams that did not finish 2023 with a winning record and had a QBR that was 20 points higher than when he played the winning squads. Here's Tua's reaction to his new deal over the weekend. I'm the highest paid employee in this in this office like I mean I I got to get my you know whatever together I got to get that right and get our guys uh, moving in that in the direction that we need to go you know to be able to do those things quite frankly too has um, shown me that throughout the entire off season that he knows what time it is um, and you fortunately uh, him and all of his teammates can go out and determine um, you know, whatever the narrative is built upon by the way they play. By the way, these personalities in Miami are just really so much fun. <laughs> I just want to say that. But, I Mina, mean, the narrative that McDaniel is alluding to is that Tua hasn't won enough big games. We showed you the numbers there to warrant this new deal. How can they put themselves in a better position to win some of these games this season? Yeah, I think – to address how they can be better in those situations against great defenses in cold weather. You have to kind of examine why they've struggled over the last couple of years. And a couple things really come to mind for me. One is your quarterback, his superpower is his accuracy. Mm -hmm. He throws with anticipation. He gets rid of the ball so quickly. He doesn't have one of the stronger arms in the league and playmaking is not his strength. And I think that can tend to become an issue, obviously in cold weather, but also when defenses get better at taking away their core concepts over the middle of the field, he has to hold on to the ball a little longer, make more difficult throws. And the other thing I think that sort of flows off of that is this is not a very good offensive line that is hid by the quarterback and by the offense. Uh, but again, when he has to hold on to the ball a little bit longer, it becomes mm. exposed. So the question this season for the Dolphins is, can either of those things get better? Quarterback making plays, offensive line, or does Mike McDaniel have to come up with a sort of a counterpunch as a way to evolve this offense because it has been an issue at the end of seasons and it will continue to be unless there's some improvement in that regard. 
And that's, I think, the problem. You know, you, th- you talk about this money and if it raises expectations of Tua or what does this mean for the team, my first question is, is it going to make him more elusive in the pocket? Is it going to make him a more willing creator, not runner? Will he give Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddle opportunities for second play chances he didn't do that last year he wouldn't create and so it was when you took away the first read there was no counter punch given to you by the quarterback and so if you can't do that then what is Mike McDaniel going to do to expand this offense what is he going to do to confuse you in some sort of way to offset some of these things that Tua Tungvaloa has to do on time in order to be successful because if they don't do that they won't beat the good defenses they won't beat the good teams. Good teams make you make an adjustment, not only pregame, but in-game. And every team that had the ability to do that to the Miami Dolphins walked away with a win. And they haven't beaten the good teams. They haven't beaten them consistently. And Tua and the Dolphins, Tua's still waiting for his first playoff victory. And so this team has stood behind him all along, and there was no surer sign of that than giving him this contract that makes him the highest paid Dolphin in franchise history. Now, that's the title I use. But we heard the title that Tua used. He's now the highest paid employee in the office, which I love that title. That's a great <laughs> I've never heard that one for a player before. We have to break that out. We've heard the highest paid player in a certain position. We've heard the highest paid player in franchise history. I've never heard the <laughs> highest paid employee in the office. But that's what Tua now is, and he's got to step up in the postseason and validate it. You know, it's interesting because when I spent some time in Miami before a couple of their games last season, he really does know every employee in that office. That's the type of person that he is from top to bottom. So I think it's why he said it that way. But either way, an interesting way to put it. Adam, you're the highest paid in this office. We are just three days away from the start of the preseason. How crazy is that in Canton, Ohio? The Hall of Fame game between the Texans and the Bears as we welcome in senior NFL insider Adam Schefter. I guess the summer, for all intents and purposes, is over for some of us, Adam. Uh, Can we expect to see Caleb Williams on Thursday? What are you hearing about that? Hannah, the Chicago Bears head coach Matt Eberflus is expected to announce some playing time rotations tomorrow, but I think it would be a surprise if you see any of the Bears starters play, and that includes their number one overall pick, Caleb Williams. This would not be the time that teams typically unveil their highly touted rookies, and you would figure it would be the same on Thursday night where they're not planning, I don't believe, to wind up playing their starters, and that means... You'll see other quarterbacks like Brett Rippon out there, not Caleb Williams. That's the type of atmosphere we usually have in the Thursday night opener. Remember, this is an extra preseason game for each team. That's what the Hall of Fame game always is, and usually coaches treat it that way, but we'll find that officially tomorrow from the Bears head coach, Matt Eberflus. Bummer. Okay, Uh, Bears and Texans Thursday at 8 Eastern on ESPN and ABC. I guess we'll see them eventually. I know that's the plan. All right, meanwhile, what the heck is going on with the Cowboys? Um, Huge questions off the field. Jordan Love and Tua, they get their contracts done at the end of last week, leaving Dak Prescott as the top quarterback without a new deal. C.D. Lamb, we know that he is still absent. What's the latest there? Well, just because Jordan Love and Tua Tungabailoa get their deals done over the weekend doesn't mean that it brings Dak Prescott any closer to a new contract. Even though the Cowboys have been in contact with Dak Prescott's agent about possibly trying to work out a deal, this is a different situation. Dak's price tag is going to be higher than any other quarterback. A deal is not close, and they can continue to talk, but a deal continues to be far away. The same is true for the Cowboys wide receiver C.D. Lamb, who's headed into the fifth-year option on his contract, still not at training camp, scheduled to make close to $18 million this upcoming season for the Dallas Cowboys. And it's a situation where they want to get this done. They've been planning to get this done, but it is still not done. And as long as it's not done, 
C.D. Lamb is not showing up to training camp, not worried about any fines he's incurring right now, knows that there's a big payday on the horizon, and it's up to both sides to figure out how they can get this done, no sign in sight. Adam, can I ask you a follow-up? Because I guess the big question is why. You know, we know what the numbers are, and the numbers aren't going to decrease. They're only going to mm -hmm. increase the longer the Cowboys wait. We know what the markets are at both positions. So what's the holdup? It shouldn't be hard to figure out. The roadmap is there for everybody. Before, Dallas was having a hard time because they knew C.D. Lamb wanted to wait for some of these other deals to come in. But now, Justin Jefferson has come in. Jalen Waddell has come in. A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith have come in. It shouldn't be that hard, and yet the two sides still are struggling. So clearly, either Dallas isn't offering what C.D. Lamb thinks he's worth, or C.D. Lamb isn't willing to take less than what he believes he's worth. But again, they are at a stalemate. No solution in sight. Sometimes these things happen. See the Niners and Nick Bosa last summer before they figured it out late in training camp. Yeah, but you're not just dealing with one player here. You're dealing with a quarterback and the guy who's, you know, responsible for most of yep. your offense. Um, yeah, the yep. lack of, of sense of urgency is, is really stunning. Here is the bottom line. Obviously, you know, Jones referring to the fact that Dak, the Cowboys, they haven't played well in the playoffs, but he hasn't given Dak a new deal. And Prescott is set to become a free agent, and he has a no-trade clause and all of the leverage. And we have Todd Archer live. It's Dak's 31st birthday today, so happy birthday to him. No one's thinking the team's going to give him any kind of present today, uh, Todd, but is he even <laughs> going to get one this season? Uh, what's the latest from your perspective? You're inside there. What are you hearing? Yeah, you mentioned his birthday, Hannah. Cowboys are off today, their first off day of training camp, and Dak's able to celebrate his birthday with his family, including his baby daughter, MJ. So a good good day for him there, and a better day whenever the Cowboys get this long deal, deal done uh, with Prescott. But one, the good news, they are talking. Last week, the Cowboys sent an offer to Prescott's agent, Todd France. Now, that was before Miami signed Tua, before Green Bay signed Jordan Love, and, and the Cowboys are in a situation now where they know what the price is. They don't believe those deals really impact much as to what Dak was going to get. But now it's just the waiting game. And it seems like the Cowboys like to play the waiting game. One guy, another guy who likes to play the waiting game is Dak Prescott. Patient in 2019, patient in 2020. God has everything he wanted in 2021. He can be patient now, knowing if he hits the open market March, next March, he's going to get everything he wants. So we, we continue to wait for this deal, even as he says he wants to be a Cowboy. And even as Jerry Jones says, he doesn't envision Dak leaving here after this season. Yeah, well, it really behooves him to wait, Todd, because that price tag, as you well know, is just going to keep going up and up. Meanwhile, though, some not so great news. So the Cowboys with a new defensive coordinator, of yeah. course, and Mike Zimmer and uh, their pass rusher, Sam Williams. He tears his left ACL. I understand he partially tore that MCL also in practice yesterday. That's a pretty big hole to fill. So where does that leave them? Yeah, it's a tough blow for the defense. They were really banking on Sam Williams this year to be a, their third pass rusher behind Micah Parsons, behind Demarcus Lawrence. They lost their top reserves last year, Dorrance Armstrong and Dante Fowler. They followed Dan Quinn to Washington. And, and Williams, a guy who has eight and a half sacks, a former second round pick, was really chomping at the bit to get a chance to show that he can fill in that role and be a productive player. On campus, the immediate guy they look to, Marshawn Nealon, their second round mm -hmm. pick. He's performed well so far early in training camp, but they haven't had any pads on yet. That'll happen tomorrow for the first time off campus. They know the names. They've just discussed guys like Carl Lawson, Yannick Ngakwe. But Hannah, stop me if you heard this before. It'll come down to price as to whether the Cowboys <laughs> retain either one of these guys. Mike Zimmer better be on his game because he might have to scheme up the pressure if they don't go out and add some more veteran pass rushing help knowing Williams is done for the season. It's going to come down to price with the Cowboys. Todd, I mean, how dialed in are you? Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> it's unbelievable. Yeah. Todd Archer, we appreciate you. As an ardent Philadelphia Eagles fan, 
Diving into the latest updates from training camp is always thrilling. The buzz around Britton Covey and the vibrant atmosphere at the Novacare Complex paints an exciting picture for the upcoming season. Let's break down the strengths and implications of these developments. Britton Covey's Momentum Underdog to Key Contributor Britton Covey's journey from undrafted rookie to a standout performer in training camp epitomizes the underdog spirit that Philly fans cherish. His perseverance through being waived and relegated to the practice squad multiple times is a testament to his resilience and determination. Covey's story resonates with the heart of Eagles fans, who appreciate players that battle adversity and emerge stronger. Dynamic Returner Covey's evolution into one of the NFL's top returners last season is a significant asset for the Eagles. Special teams often go underappreciated, but having a reliable and dynamic returner can be a game-changer. Covey's ability to gain crucial yards and flip field position provides the offense with better starting points and can be pivotal in close games. His knack for making plays under pressure injects excitement and unpredictability into the game, something that can demoralize opponents and ignite the home crowd. Versatility and moxie as a receiver Covey's impressive showings as a wide receiver during training camp highlight his versatility. Adding depth to the receiving core and showcasing his ability to make plays in different roles adds a layer of unpredictability to the Eagles' offense. Head coach Nick Sirianni's praise for Covey underscores the coaching staff's belief in his potential to contribute significantly this season. His agility, quickness, and fearlessness make him a valuable asset in the slot or on trick plays designed to capitalize on his speed and elusiveness. The electrifying atmosphere at training camp. A magnet for celebrities and experts. The star-studded attendance at the Eagles' training camp featuring personalities like Jameer Nelson, Aaron Boone, and the Liverpool coaching staff, speaks volumes about the franchise's allure and the anticipation surrounding the team. This influx of notable figures highlights the broader appeal and cultural significance of the Eagles, drawing attention from various spheres and amplifying the excitement around the team. Media Frenzy and Fan Engagement the media coverage from NFL Network and K. Adams Up and Adams Show further accentuates the vibrant atmosphere at the Novacare Complex. Interviews with stars like A.J. Brown and Jalen Hurts provide fans with insider insights and foster a deeper connection with the players. This extensive media presence keeps fans engaged and informed, enhancing their emotional investment in the team's journey. Implications for the Upcoming Season Building momentum. The positive momentum from training camp, fueled by standout performances and a high-energy environment, sets a strong foundation for the season. Players like Covey stepping up add depth and versatility to the roster, which is crucial for navigating the grueling NFL schedule. The camaraderie and focus observed during these sessions can translate into a cohesive and resilient team on the field. High expectations. The heightened media attention and celebrity interest underscore the high expectations for the Eagles this season. This scrutiny can be a double-edged sword, providing motivation but also adding pressure. However, with the leadership of seasoned veterans and the strategic acumen of the coaching staff, the Eagles are well-equipped to harness this energy and channel it into on-field success. Conclusion. In summary, the updates from the Eagles' training camp reflect a team brimming with potential and poised for an exciting season. Britton Covey's rise and the electrifying atmosphere at the Novacare Complex are indicative of a franchise ready to make a significant impact. As fans, we can look forward to a season filled with thrilling plays, strategic brilliance, and, hopefully, a deep playoff run. Fly, Eagles, fly! Bom, Lucas, ele apoia a namorada Ana Satila após quarto lugar em Paris. Você vai ser campeã olímpica. Brasileira recebeu abraços do namorado após é, a prova de caiaques simples. No caso de caiaques simples. 
Aqui tem o um videozinho, mas não posso mostrar, infelizmente. Quem estiver interessado, é só pesquisar aí, que provavelmente vai aparecer. Acho que ninguém imagina como é para o atleta olímpico que se entrega diariamente chegar tão próximo da medalha. É aquilo, né? Tão perto, mas tão longe. Mas não consegui. A declaração de Ana Satila resume o sentimento da brasileira depois de ficar em quarto lugar na prova de caiaque simples de canoagem slalom. Eu acho que se pronuncia dessa forma, não sei. Nas Olimpíadas de Paris, o resultado foi o melhor da modalidade na história do país, mas a atleta queria o pódio. Depois da prova, ela recebeu o apoio do namorado, o remador Lucas. Lucas Vertin. Aqui tá a foto. Ai, gente, foi, foi fofo. Foi fofo, mas realmente eu acredito... Também que a pessoa tem que ter muita mente, porque é muita pressão psicológica, entendeu? Porque, poxa, é nas Olimpíadas, então imagina o nível que é estar tá, assim. Somente, mas eu acredito que somente de você estar ali presente já é um grande, assim, um grande privilégio, já é um, um baita de uma conquista, entendeu? Por mais que eu não tenha ganhado, foi em quarto lugar, mas ainda assim, ela... Assim, ela conquistou algo de alguma forma, mas eu sei que não foi o que ela esperava, né? Porque ninguém quer ficar em quarto lugar, a gente sempre quer o primeiro, né? Sempre o melhor, ainda mais que a gente se esforça muito. Mas não foi dessa vez, né? Quem sabe de uma próxima ela não consiga. Enfim, muito simples, né? Ela está sentindo agora essa tristeza. Ela coloca realmente o objetivo muito alto da carreira dela. Ela se dedica demais. É, só ela sabe o que passa para estar aqui. Ela tirou muita onda. É a quarta melhor do mundo. Não só isso. Foi na prova dela de estreia. Ainda vai competir na canoa. Uma prova que ela é muito boa, disse Lucas Vert. No caso, ela disse o namorado dela, né? Aí, no momento, eu abracei e falei. Pode colocar para fora. Eu estou contigo, independentemente do resultado. Se você for a primeira ou a última, eu te amo e estou sempre com você. Muito bonitinho. E você tem que entender, você vai ganhar nessa canoa, vai ser campeã olímpica. Agora você sente isso e usa a seu favor. Daqui a dois, três dias você vai estar no pódio. Você fez o melhor resultado da canoagem brasileira e vai conquistar a primeira medalha da história da canoagem brasileira. Bom, gente, essa foi a notícia. Espero que vocês tenham gostado. Um beijo a todos vocês. Não esqueçam de se inscrever no canal, deixar o seu like, porque ajuda muito, tá bom? Um beijo e até a próxima. Nadadora do Brasil expulsa das Olimpíadas diz que denunciou o caso de assédio e se defende. Nossa, que pesado, meu Deus. Ana Carolina Vieira afirma que está em Portugal, que vai revelar todos os detalhes do assédio e que está desamparada. A nadadora brasileira Ana Carolina Vieira se pronunciou pela primeira vez sobre a expulsão das Olimpíadas de Paris em 2024. Em vídeos nas redes sociais, ela se defendeu afirmando que não teve má conduta e que está em Portugal, desamparada. Ela revelou que ainda que denu... que ela revelou ainda que denunciou um caso de assédio da... na seleção de natação ao ao COB e nada ao acho que é ao... É, o seu Cobb, né? Cobb. E nada foi feito. Bom, não consegui falar com ninguém. Me mandaram falar com os canais do Cobb, mas como vou entrar em contato com os canais do Cobb, se já fiz uma denúncia e nada foi resolvido de assédio dentro da seleção. Realmente, gente, uma situação muito complicada, chata e crime, né? Crime, assédio é crime. Enfim, a brasileira nas redes sociais não especificou como ocorreu o assédio e nem quando. Então, não sabemos o que rolou, mas ela disse que foi um assédio. Mas disse que irá revelar todos os detalhes com a ajuda de um advogado. Vou falar tudo, vou falar com os meus advogados, tudo certinho. Prometo falar tudo. Estou em... Estou triste, nervosa, não sei. Mas estou... 
com o coração em paz. Sei do meu caráter e da minha índole. Isso que importa. Espero poder defender a natação brasileira feminina. Contem comigo. Só peço um tempo e um pouco de paciência. Ainda segundo a Ana Caroline, ela teve de deixar a Vila Olímpica sem arrumar direito as malas e sem contato com ninguém. Ela só foi-se embora. É... Bom, aqui tá a foto dela, essa foi a notícia. Eu espero que todos tenham gostado e entendido. Não esqueçam de se inscrever no canal porque ajuda muito, tá? Deixa seu like, ativa o sininho. E obrigada a cada um que ficou até o final. É realmente muito legal e importante. E eu espero que toda essa situação aí, né, se resolva logo. Porque é realmente muito chata, triste, né? Enfim, um beijo e até a próxima.